everybody, and welcome again to an episode of The Risk Matrix with James Junkin and Dr. Martin. And today we have a special guest, Nikolai Assign, and he's Senior VP of Compliance and, and Risk. Um, he's in Kenmore outside of Banff, okay? So again, as, as he will tell you later, it's a small town, but, but what we know it as Banff, it's like a small Aspen. So uh, let's let's go with that. And um, he's going to talk to us about labor laws um, in Canada and some of the new things that are coming out. So thank you again for coming, Nikolai. Um, this episode, um, again, as always, is powered by Verforce. Um, we don't have a sponsor this episode, so I'm going to let James lead right into our topic and maybe give a better introduction to Nikolai. Welcome, Nikolai. Welcome. Thank you very Nikolai. much for having me. Oh. Welcome. Thanks. I know I've worked with you and Dr. Martin has in our capacity as board members on the Verifor Strategic Advisory Board. And, and as a lead in, you know, uh, a lot of our American audience doesn't probably uh, understand or, or, or really are aware of the vastness of Verifor's reach throughout the globe. You know, Verifor now is, has operations in Canada, operations in the EU and the UK. Uh, South Africa, where you're from originally, um, Australia, and around the globe. And so Nikolai is involved in a lot of the international operations of Verifors. And as we were discussing in the SAB meeting earlier today, you know, as Americans, we could learn some things from the rest of the world. A lot of times we, we, we're closed, closed ears and open mouth, and we want to tell the rest of the world how things work in America. But different cultures, different value systems require different approaches. And so our Canadian cousins to the north uh, are working on some new child labor laws, which was part of a discussion in an earlier episode with you and I, Dr. Martin, about the rising trend uh, in the U.S. of violators of child labor laws and the attempt uh, in some legislatures to actually lower the ages in which uh, children, if you will, uh, can enter the workforce and, and limitations on the hours they can work and, and around the hazardous conditions in which they may be exposed to and some of the work environment uh, challenges for safety professionals in educating children in the workforce on what the hazards are and how to protect themselves. You know, we've had uh, a lot of discussions uh, in, in training and educational networks about adult learners, but children often have different needs and, and different ways of teaching them as well. So that's kind of a preface of where we are. If you've not watched that episode, go back and check out child labor uh, issues in the U.S. in our previous episode, and that will kind of inform you of what we're going to be talking about in the international setting with our friend Nikolai. Welcome, Nikolai. Thanks again. What's happening in Canada? Driving to this topic, maybe you introduced the topic by noting that the U.S. might be trailing in some areas of regulation, but maybe ahead in other areas of regulation. So let's maybe start there and say that in, in Europe, we typically find that around issues relating to human rights uh, and things like child labor and forced labor um, because of their history of the war, of the wars. And what's happened there? I think they are a bit more progressive in how they how they lay down the law and the European Union as a, as an entity as well. So we see that in in countries like uh, England, they've had um, a concept called modern slavery um, is what they've been espousing, and they've been pushing it down into the supply chain as well to see how if there are incidences of modern slavery happening happening within their um, their supply chains and making organizations responsible for uh, mitigating that kind of a risk. And I think those concepts have sort of filtered across the ocean um, and being the, the strong link that Canada has with the United Kingdom, having a king and all, um, I think that's what's filtered through. So the legislation per se is not just about child labor. It is about the concept of the, the Act is actually titled Fighting Against Forced Labor and Child Labor in Supply Chains Act. So the focus is definitely on the supply chain and it's on labor 
and it's divided into two elements of forced labor and the element of child labor and looking at companies that uh, that provide goods in Canada or import goods or sell goods or uh, utilize goods and how they how their supply chains deal with issues of child and forced labor um, even outside of Canada and it places a certain responsibility on those companies to deal with these issues so that's that's where this new legislation comes from yeah, I, I actually, um, I was in on that conversation earlier that James had with the Verforce Strategic Advisory Board. And, um, you know, I, I would completely agree with what the other parties were saying that we, that we do, we do lag behind, but as you say, sometimes we're ahead, but we do lag, lag behind in the awareness of these topics and actually um, doing something about them. And, and we do have child labor laws here, but um, I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, what was the impetus of this new law or these new laws in Canada, and and what are the nuances that you know we could learn from um, that are that are much better um, in Canada and the new law and around the world um, that we should be aware of because and this is a two part question. You're the ESG expert, right? And so. And as the ESG expert, you know how things affect the supply chain and, and people mm. are looking at this now, investors are looking mm. at this. And so not only is it um, a responsibility in the supply chain that's kind of forcing people to this, this outcome, okay, mm. uh, of, of looking at this, but but it is a, it is a human rights thing. It is a, um, an ethical dilemma as well. That's right. So my take on this is that the legislation is not an attempt to micro regulate and prescribe to industry and to the world, well, to industry in Canada, how to manage their day to day affairs. Uh, it's a concept, let's, uh, it's a concept known as controlled self regulation, whereby parameters are set by government within which organizations need to determine uh, by way of risk assessment to determine their risk and their exposure and then their mitigation paths to reduce this risk. So it's a quite a progressive way of legislating. It's not your typical stick way of saying they shall do this and they sh shan't do that. Um, that's the domain of actual labor legislation, which, which would stipulate working hours, working conditions, working ages, um, arrest periods, all of that. This is not what that legislation is at all. So I would actually not even put this in the domain of labor legislation. I would put this in the domain of human rights type legislation. And I think it falls full square within this controversial topic of ESG. Um, I don't even like that name for that topic because it's actually very misleading. And I've been reading very interesting articles that agree with that, that we should just be looking at that entire topic as total risk management um, for organizations and look at all of the risks and opportunities and manage that instead of being blinded by uh, uh, an acronym like like ESG, which is all politicized and and, and and ruffles people's feathers on on both sides of the political spectrum. So I'd state that this is uh, human rights legislation, which falls within the category of of of, of social and I would say that it's an element of risk management that all organizations have to be aware of. And the legislation is that of controls, brings forth the principle of controlled self-regulation. So how it works is that the government states that they do not want to see, obviously, it is forbidden to have forced labor and child labor within your organization or within supply chains. Now, the definition of forced and, and forced labor is taken from some of the Gen um, Geneva Conventions and Geneva Regulations, and then the definition of what child labour is is, uh, is 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 also taken from the Geneva Conventions. So what they've done is they've aligned themselves internationally so that the same principles are applied, um, and it's not a standalone set of legislation. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, forced labour and child labour is forbidden. That's that's a clear fact. But then how you regulate and implement it vis-a-vis -vis your supply chains is up to the organizations to implement because usually what happens with legislation like this, legislation gets promulgated uh, and regulations. And then over time, 
a, a set of guidelines gets developed by the government so that there's more clarity on how to report on these things. Currently, there are no guidelines for this. So we need to take a common sense approach and a risk-based approach to it. So what we've done is we've looked at the requirements of this um, regulation and what the, the regulation, it's not a complex bit of regulation. First of all, it goes about setting out which entities uh, this regulation applies to. So it's your larger type organizations within Canada and also companies that manage other companies. And it's specific to goods being being sold um, and, and imported into, into Canada. Why? Because services are typically rendered in Canada and we have sufficient domestic legislation to cater for um, labor laws, to cater for child and forced labor and those kind of things. So what this is really intended to do is to look at your extended supply chain in other countries where there might not be good regulation uh, and definitely not good enforcement. So what happens is that you, um, products get job shopped out to a country with terrible uh, labor and child labor history and then just gets sent over the border and from there gets imported into Canada and at a fantastic price and a low price and everybody's happy because their hands are clean yet deep in the supply chain a tier two tier three tier four down into the sub supply chain that's where all the nasty business takes place yet this organization can then distance and remove themselves from the the the, the, the terrible things that accompanies this product into their into the consumer's hand. So what the legislator's done, it's created the framework to say that every organization of a certain size and turnover, and there are preconditions that's technical, we don't need to, to get into that. Um, but those companies that this applies to, they have to send a report, submit a report to the minister every year, end of May, and the first one is due now in 2024, on their entire high risk supply chain. And in that report, they have to give, they have to attach their policy. Then they have to explain what is the process that they've done to identify and mitigate the risk of forced labor and child labor within their supply chains. So that is a big ask. That so is. they then need to take a reasonable approach and say, well, what are the reasonable mitigating steps that we can do? What are the types of data we need to collect from our supply chains to properly answer to this? And then they also have to give a, 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 a statement as to the level of assurance they have that this data and this report that they have is correct. They have to indicate how many instances they found of, of, of forced and child labor and then what they've done to mitigate that. Have they stopped that? And also what have they done to, 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 to make up the loss of income, those uh, probably low on the economic ladder families have had because they now prohibited from working. What steps have they taken to either try and re-employ them under better conditions or to try and um, uplift those, those, those families? So it's definitely from a social justice perspective and a human rights perspective that this legislation was drafted. But it comes with criminal sanctions if you do not comply. So mm, we just had a session yesterday with our clients, and this was a, a big topic. The questions are, are, are large, and clients don't know where to start. And I'm just trying to guide them into the direction of a risk-based approach and, and to create this report the same way they take any other volatile topic and deal with it in an organization. You know, yeah, when I Nikolai, first, this is groundbreaking. This is groundbreaking, because when I first heard the topic, you know, um, when we're talking about forced labor and child labor laws, the first uh, on face value without digging deep, you know, I'm thinking, well, this is a solution in search of a problem. But when you expand this to the supply chain, now you have really opened Pandora's box because most companies are not equipped to look down into the supply chain. And let's be honest, some people don't want to look down into their supply Absolutely. chain, They're afraid of what they'll find. And, and we, we see that in the U.S., we see that in, in a lot of other industrialized countries that outsource, particularly in the manufacturing of, of certain goods uh, to other countries in, in the underdeveloped world or the emerging world, right? So as an organization, based on what's happening in Canada, if I'm headquartered in Canada, if I heard you right, or if I'm shipping goods or services into Canada, this law would apply 
And I would have to have policies and mechanisms in place to ensure that every entity in my supply chain is, is conforming to the regulation and respecting the human rights of uh, forced labor and, and the, uh, um, not using children in inappropriate labor situations. Is that, that I, I got a handle on that. Is that and basically before it? you answer that, Nikolai, I want to make one comment. One thing that's really important here, James, that you didn't add on to that sentence is the fact that they need to provide information about how they're going to re-employ or right. make make these people whole that are providing those goods and services. And that that's that is that is a full cycle human um uh human factor right there. That's that's like that's like critical, right? I mm -hmm. mean you're telling them to look deep, but you're telling them to repair as well. Right. Repair right. and not and mitigate and make whole, which is, that's cool. Yeah, so, 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 so two comments there. First of all, to James, it's not related to services. It's producing, sales, selling, or distributing goods only. Right. I don't, the definition of goods uh, is not specifically given. So uh, you know, companies were asking me, I work in the oil and gas industry, we give a service, but we provide a liner for a pond as part of our service. We, do I fall under this? And I would say that uh, you take the precautionary approach here. Yeah? And, and if it's not crisp, then you say yes, because there are some goods involved in what they what they sell. So if a portion is goods, a portion of service, I would say that it's included. If it's a full on say only a cloud-based software company like software as a service type company i would say that they are definitely excluded from this um and it's more about the there has to be a component of good in in, in goods uh associated with it so but the rest of your assessment is correct um james um if i could just ask and then i just want to related to that of, of who it applies to so this is a simplistic example, but I'm a simple person. I'm from Alabama. Roll Tide, right? So just bear with me. Roll Tide. Let's say I am uh, a retailer of personal protective equipment. I have a safety supply store, and I sell to my customers things like hard hats and N95 dust masks, things of that nature. Some of those products historically come from countries with very poor human rights records. Is it my responsibility as the retailer, as I examine my supply chain, if I displace someone in another country, is the expectation that now I have to make that person whole way down that supply chain or is it only making whole those uh citizens and immigrants that are within the borders of canada so first of all the first part of this regulation is about the, the, the sort of the screening level of which organizations and entities this applies to directly and this is this is definitely aimed at the larger organizations because it would be companies that are listed on the stock exchange or have a place of business in Canada, do business or have assets in Canada, and comply with two of the following. 20 million or more in assets, 40 million or more in revenue, 250 or more employees. So you have to comply with two of those three and do business in Canada um, in goods. Now, if, if that applies to you, then yes. Then you have to look, then you have to make sure that all the requirements in this regulation are then complied with. In other words, you need to send that report to the minister. And the, in order to send that report and have the correct content, that means you need to look at your entire supply chain and try and understand and elicit the responses. So one of the elements is if in your examination of your supply chain, you find that there's a deviation or a non-conformance against this act. In other words, there's an instance of forced and child labor. And the measure gets taken to correct that. In other words, we stop the forced labor, we stop the child labor. And there's a lack of income for that family. Yes, that lack of income has to made, be made whole in some way, manner or form. It does not say measures need to be taken. 
that's the wording so how the company does that is up to them and then it will be evaluated by the minister to, to determine whether it's deemed satisfactory or not so to link to um to dr martin's uh, uh statement yes this is indeed a, a restorative justice so to speak uh on its in, in, in a very progressive form it's not just a negative do not do the following or establishing certain rights on on organization this is actually an active act that is expected of organizations so it is a very progressive um uh, concept that's being implemented here so we have this controlled self-regulation with this progressive end goal of restorative justice so it's very far um you know on on the scale of of advanced and progressive legislation really yeah so let's see how will it get implemented because obviously you need a you're going to have quite a robust engagement needed by the the minister to to evaluate these things intelligently and then respond to that and over time develop a guideline document as a companion to to these concepts because these are new concepts so so before i forget how, how do they how does the government or the minister identify people who may meet one or two of these or is it you know i'm going to just be self-reporting um how is that done yeah it's it's full on self-reporting one would one would imagine that over time the minister would have the capability of targeting the couple of high um tall trees i would suggest and and then take them to task if they've not done the report and there are there are sanctions in the regulation obviously criminalizing the the non-compliance with it so and uh, so i would say it's in the interest of a board to look at this closely and make sure that that they implement this properly because why would anybody take a risk on behalf of their organization uh, uh, to implement a legal requirement as imposed by government so um it's it's not going to be an easy map to find out who falls within this category but i'm sure looking at their at their tax returns bank statements um whether these companies are listed or not uh it's not a really hard exercise for a government agency with access to all of this information and bank details to really quickly figure out what the value uh, of a company is and whether they fall in two of those three categories in the, in, in the previous um, reporting cycle. I don't think that's a, high, a big lift at all. So I, I also um, I think it's it's interesting that they anchor it to the Geneva Convention principles and the, and the definitions in the Geneva Convention because that's something. Um, at least for the people who who signed on to that, that um, they're aware of those, they've agreed upon those, and it's not for it's not open for discussion, right? It's it's just really that that's it, unless everybody gets together and decides again. Um, I also I think that it, it's a really bold move by Canada um, to put something in place that basically has repercussions around the world positive and negative right positive and negative people who are doing business in and to Canada um and also the people who might be harmed by this I mean that that is a that is a bold move and I, I guess that's just a statement I'm not looking you can comment on it or not but um I I mean I guess I didn't realize like James said that that the the, the depth to the to which this um affects not only companies but it affects a broader scope of of the world population and and, and countries around the world so well, yeah. without that the uh, only thing i have to add to that is that the the fact that it's got this extra extra judicial effect outside of the boundaries of canada is why they've gone and linked the definitions of forced and child labor with the geneva convention to give it legitimacy international of course um you know to, to, to reduce the pushback so so it was, seems to be from that perspective well thought through so the, I think the key part that really comes with economic stability, not only for an individual family, but for the entire planet, is companies cannot just disassociate themselves from uh, poor supply chain actors that they may have been using uh, for many, many years and just pull that out and say, we'll, we'll build a factory to manufacture in the US or in the Western hemisphere or you know wherever and 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 just walk away and and leave a path of devastation um behind so 
Uh, that, that's very interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, and like Dr. Martin said, I, I really didn't understand uh, how far this went uh, from a mm -hmm. legislative standpoint. Now, let's say I'm a business owner that's part of a publicly traded company. It's a large company that meets those two categories that um, would apply to make us subject to this legislation. What are some things I should be thinking about and how can Veriforce help? Right. Let's start with what the steps I would take if I was if I was in the um, in an organization that needed to respond to this. First of all, I would you need to draw for draft organizational policy and in that policy they need to set out to obviously make the commitment that they will be compliant to these uh, this re regulation they they need to make the commitment of how they're going to be addressing that the fact that they they will be diving into their um their, their high risk supply chains because also the the legislation requires only high risk categories of supply chains to be addressed because obviously we know that certain categories are higher than others and then in that document or in a supporting document, maybe your actual practical procedure that, that stems from that policy, you would go about and say, what are the steps that your organization would be taking to, number one, in other words, identify your high risk supply chains, then go about getting information out of those supply chains, evaluating that information, and then taking necessary steps if there's a deviation that they meet. And one of the final steps that you have to take uh, and, and, and discuss in this document is um, you have to assess the effectiveness of ensuring that forced and child labor are not being used in your business and supply chains. So implicit in that is almost a level of data assurance that's being required when you collect this data and that's going to be different for every organization but from my perspective that could mean anything from a zoom type desktop assessment and conversation with different suppliers or a percentage of doing a physical assessment on either warehousing or manufacturing facilities looking at their books etc so we you might have to decide to do a physical audit and assessment or to get some assurance link to this data, especially if you think they very high risk um, in certain industries or in certain countries, um, that, that would be a requirement over time. So um, how would we how would we use a company like Veriforce that manages compliance and, and, and in supply chains? I would I think we've developed a question sets that our clients can use to collect the types of data that would make it easy for them to show that they've assessed their supply chains and that they've made decisions on their supply chains and how they've made their decisions and what steps they've taken. So we would we would we prepare these questions on, on on again on different sort of levels of maturity. The first one would be screening type questions, which would make it easy for the client to identify. They push down those question sets to their supply chain, and that would give them an easy indication of. Um, has this supply chain of theirs, the top tier supplier, do they, have they implemented measures against uh, forced and child labor? And have they done things to look at their supply, sub supply chains as well? And do they have data around that? So that would be our first step. Is, 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 is this risk even being, even on the radar of our supply, of our different supply chains? Then we ask them questions to provide proof that that this has actually been properly implemented and evaluated, not just a policy, but that the policy stands implemented by way of audit report, by way of what have they done if instances are found of child and forced labor. And also, if it was found, what have they done to mitigate the risk, the impact, the financial impact on those families, on those individuals? Um, we also ask, uh, we also provide a type of a question, we call it self-attestation, where we require a um, a member, a, a, a employee of the supply chain company um, with, with, with a high enough designation that they can represent that company to attest that that company is not engaged in any forced labor or child labor and we highlight the definitions so that what does this mean you as a company 
who now have to submit this report, you have to show that you have that taken reasonable measures and due diligence is nothing but reasonable measures to assess a particular risk. So in order to do that, you collect different pieces of data from different data sources um, and different levels of assurance, and you package it up in this report to government to show, well, we've, we've identified our high-risk contra uh, contractors and suppliers, we've asked them different types of questions, and we've evaluated it with the different levels of assurance, and if there were deviations, we've taken steps, and we've self-assured further. In my mind, that's a nice way to close the loop of our methodology to go about de describing that in the report to the Ministry of what they've done and where they stand. Um, regulations might come out, as we said earlier, in the formal guideline that might make this reasoning obsolete and give us a succinct yes or no, I've done this or I've done that or described this. That, that, then that's fine, then you apply those questions. But we have a good product in something like Verifrost. Where we have a network of 8,000 suppliers globally, where these types of questions can be pushed down into those relevant supply chains, and the data can be collected, and then those, those data can be used to answer these questions and create these reports. So I would say we are ideally suited um, as a vessel to get the correct data in front of a decision maker in, in our, for, for our clients in Canada. So, I'm going to say this, you're either going to like it or not like it, Nikolai. I think you're going to like it, maybe. Yes, I agree with you that all those things are fantastic. What's the best thing behind that? Your knowledge and expertise. And I'm not trying to kiss up to you, James, James would know I don't kiss up to anyone, okay? Um, but... If you're listening to this show, what I will say is you want to make sure that somebody's not giving you these lists and, 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 and making some kind of a plan for your company as you're reporting things to the government, right? The government of Canada, under penalties of criminal penalties, right? Behind it, that somebody like yourself who's, who's well spoken on this issue can guide you through it, right? That's a service that's on to itself, okay? I know how to get a hold of you. I mean, I won't call you off, but I might call you more um, now um, that, I, I, that you're kind of educating me on these things. Um, my hope is in the future that Air Force sees the wisdom, um, if they haven't already, to grant a team of people to do those types of audits and to, to, to have you guide them through um, really the complexity that, 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 that these questionnaires and, and things, things may not touch, right? right? The nuances, the thoughts, the hmm, that's, 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 that's a really, really good question. question. Let me let me just talk talk touch with our senior vice president and the rest of his because he can answer that. Let me ask him so I can get it right, right? Because 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 there's there's there's, there's, there's one portion of this which is, which is getting getting to the crux of the matter, and then there's, there's now we have the crux of the matter. How do we how do we handle it? How do we handle it? Right? And and I know you're. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're busy enough, enough right? right? I'll probably, probably make, make you busy, busy for a lifetime uh, uh, with this type of thing. It's, it's certainly as is as you should be coming up against all across the world. world. And, and I'm with you, you that I don't like like the issue. And I, and I, like, I would like, like to see that get rid of the red on the only total risk in a total risk solution. So, like it or don't like it, I said it in very, very first person. Well, I, I, I really like, like it. I, I, I would say that from a, a, a company, company perspective, our response on that would be that on our, 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 our roadmap, roadmap of positioning ourselves, ourselves as a full range management of supply line chain company, we are investing in the ability of putting together a share under any teams for all these different topics in the whole ESG world, inclusive of supply chains, depending on the level of the time lines, might be clear on that, that in some way, when we involve all the other people, with other other properly and trying to get the terms out of the team. So we are expecting to follow our roadmap forward. forward. It's, it's a great great realization. Well, well, I can have an idea of what I'm going to ask. Um, but but if you didn't know, you're going to miss this. Well, I'm glad you're on my team because I'm probably going to call you every once in a while now and say, 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 say,